We've had an amazing few months here on Upfront and we're not far from 100,000 subscribers. Once we've hit that landmark, one of our lucky 100,000 will be offered an opportunity to come in the studio here to watch a recording of the show. I'll show you behind the scenes, you'll be able to meet a guest and you'll be able to bring a mate along. To be in with a chance of winning, make sure you subscribed and leave a comment below on this episode. We'll pick one winner at random once we've hit 100,000 subscribers. So best of luck. You were brought up in in Sheffield in the 70s and your name was Sebastian. You either learned yeah. to run or to fight. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to probably get into trouble for saying this. I don't want to cheapen mental well-being because it is, it's thrown out a lot. I agree. There are only two truly global sports. I'm probably going to get shot down for saying mm -hmm. this. It's football and track and field. I am elected to protect the female category. Mm -hmm. And if I don't do that, no woman will ever win another sporting event. Right. And they believe that, it, that doping is rife in their sports. Yeah. W what do you feel about your sports? This is Upfront with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So with this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up to proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way. And more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, a man who led the way during a rich period of British dominance on the athletics track, summed up by sporting rivalries with Steve Ovitt and Steve Cram. He went on to capture two golds and two silver medals across consecutive Olympic Games. As he moved from athlete to administrator, he helped bring the world's greatest sporting event to London in 2012 and continues to lead world athletics as we head towards another Olympic year in Paris. Sebastian Coe, welcome to Upfront. Great to be on. Listen, on, on this podcast, I've spoken to a lot of sports people from Ballon d'Or winners to world champion boxers to rugby World Cup winners to... I'm sorry you're trading down. To le no, no, so <laughs> legendary jockeys, tennis major winners, but we've never spoken to an Olympian. So you're the first one, which is oh, great. And not okay. just an Olympian, Sebastian Coe the Olympian in my mind in certain respects, given I grew up in an era um, where my father was a footballer, I ended up buying a football club and all the sports I liked were football, tennis and cricket. But I also was drawn to athletics and specifically and explicitly because of you and Ovet and Daley Thompson, that generation of athletes. that soon cl seemed... closest friend, Daley. Yeah, uh, I actually interviewed Daley for um, the fitness coach job at Crystal Palace. Didn't get it, but it was really engaging to listen to him. One of the things that we do in this is discuss what creates somebody, what turns the Seb Co of a young man that watches the 1968 Olympics mm -hmm. into this elite athlete and the journey that he goes on. So, it, as I say, it goes under this expression of what's your why? Well, where would you start? Uh, look, I've always thought we are all products of landscape, geography, neighbourhood, yeah. family, friends, where we get educated, if we get educated. And for me, I, I have a sort of quite an interesting background because my grandfather was Indian. Right. My mum was obviously half Indian. Um, you know, she'd wear a sari th three days a week. I was born in London. My dad was from the East End, right. very, very poor background. I mean, he was born in one room on Cambridge Heath Road. And my mother came from a very different type of family. They were portrait painters and writers and novelists. So creative. They were, the, they were creative. Yeah. And, and, I, and I was born in Hammersmith yeah. and then moved Sled ste steadily through the Midlands and then the north of England, where you know my my old man was a uh, manufacturing engineer. So How old were you when you moved? I was uh, well. I moved out of London before I really remember it. Up right. through the Midlands, he sort of ran businesses there, and then we ended up. He ended up managing a running a cutlery business in Sheffield. So, sort of, my I tend to think my formative years were in South Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. Which was in itself an interesting, yeah. you know, uh, culturally very different from London. Well, yeah. if you yeah. were you were brought up in in Sheffield in the seventies, mm. and your name was Sebastian, you either learned yeah. to run or to fight. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, it, it was a you know, and, and I look back on that thinking that was fabulous because yeah. it gave me a, a view of a part of the world I probably wouldn't have really understood, and I feel a sort of I do feel an affinity mm -hmm. with with the north. I ran for Yorkshire for for many years, so. 
The why, I've always loved running. Yeah. I've always loved running. If my parents were still around, they'd have told you that from the age of two and a half, three, you know, I, I ran everywhere. And it was one of those, It's it was a physical sensation I just loved. And it's an interesting concept and you, you know, you'd get this in a heartbeat, but we all talk about sport. You pick your sport. I don't think you pick your sport. I think your sport picks you. And for me, it was just the physical sensation of running. I loved running. Right. And the landscapes that I was lucky enough to be able to, to train in when it really mattered of course. were yeah. the Peak District and, you know, the fells yeah. and, and, and the valleys. And for me, landscape is, is really important. And it's a charitable description of what I now do, but I do still run. Mm -hmm. And that's my day. I, you know, it's, it's what makes me feel who I am. But it's a niche sport, isn't it? Athletics. I mean, what, what what drives you? I mean, I know you said that you like, you know, you wanted to run everywhere, um, but to want to compete in athletics and to want to be an athlete from the outset, what what was it that set it alight? Was it something on television? Was it something that you saw in your peer well, group? Was it something yeah. in your background from your yeah. from your parents' side introduced it, into your thinking? It's a mix of all those things. Right. You know, we say it's a niche sport. It is and it isn't. I mean, we've had a world championships this year. It's the biggest global sporting event on the calendar. We've mm -hmm. had 211 competing countries. Um, and, and actually, if it's a niche sport, that is our fault. Mm -hmm. We could be, we can, and we will be doing more to make it more relatable. And the problem, I mean, you, you've touched on some really interesting themes here. One of the problems we've got is that it's a it's a 150 year old sport <laughs> most of the things that were familiar certainly in the 20s and 30s don't look a lot different now on the track so one of the challenges going forward is what does the product look like mm -hmm. how are people consuming you know from your media background sure. you know everybody's just absorbing stuff in a in a very different yeah. way so we've got to be a lot braver about how we we have fantastic assets more people run than in a in a participatory mm -hmm. fashion than do any other sport on the planet but the so if if i go back to the early days we were very lucky and i resp i accept this you talked about daily steam mm -hmm. and tessa and people that came through we came through at a time when football was a really Average product. Yeah, in the 70s. Yeah. 70s. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm older than you, yeah. but I was watching. The England team was falling apart. You yeah, know, in absolutely. Europe, you know, we had our problems yeah. on, you know, on the field, outside, off the field, on the field, you know, teams were being banned yeah. from Europe. So what was interesting was that Daly and Steve and Tessa suddenly started to come through. And it wasn't about just winning domestic stuff or occasionally getting lucky in the European Championships. We were delivering world and Olympic champions and stacked mm. up against what was going on in football. Yeah. Cricket was, I know you're a cricket fan, cricket yeah. was very much in and out. Rugby, we were getting slaughtered mm -hmm. every time we played Tennis, against we Wales. Tennis, we didn't have much going on, did we? So in a way, um, how did I go from loving running? I, I w was never a team player. Right. Um, I used to play football, rugby badly and occasionally cricket, but it, it it used to it did frustrate me then and it would have increasingly frustrated me you know i just i knew i i felt comfortable about failing yeah but i needed to On my know own terms yeah yeah i needed to know it was they yeah. were my shortcomings yeah. or the coaching team's shortcomings not because i'd done everything i possibly could and i just watched 5 6 10 years of work go down the what's it was it always part of your shtick or psyche that I'm going to be an Olympic champion. That's my. That's where I'm going. No, because you're single-minded, right? Yeah. By the very nature of not wanting to be affected by other people, it illustrates an element of single-mindedness, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I guess there was an element of that, but I don't. I don't think that's the whole story. I certainly didn't think that when I joined an athletics club that there was some destiny rolled right. out in front of me. Because I remember coming off a rain-soaked training pitch because we didn't actually have a track available in in sheffield that was really usable most times of the year so we used to train the house the house we were in backed on some university playing fields so i used to train a lot on the university um, facilities and my father who was only really probably two years into coaching me and his mm -hmm. 
his introduction into the sport was an interesting and a funny one. But I remember walking off this training pitch, soaked through at about seven o'clock one night, walking back up to the house. And he just actually almost out of nowhere said, <clears throat> by the way, I want you to get used to a concept. And I'm 14. I was barely knew what the word concept meant. And he said, um, you're going to go to the Olympic Games. He said, I think you will be a world beater. And I just want you to start getting used to that concept because I'm guessing that for some it comes as a bit of a shock. So, you know, if if what I've got in mind comes to fruition, you'll be there in sort of 1980. This so what was, year is this? This is like 1972. 1972. So you, what were you then, 16? 15. Yeah. 15, yeah. And he said, I think that's... So I just want you to start getting used to that one. You know, I wasn't thinking much beyond, you know, Sheffield Wednesday's next mm. home game and probably trying to, you know, get around a bit yeah. of homework. You have your father and father, son or father daughter um, relationships have often proven to be troublesome. We've yeah. seen with Steffi Graf and Peter Graf, yeah, sure. we're seeing some of the challenges, uh, the reports in the white report into the gymnastics and the pushing of athletes. Yeah, for sure. Did you feel that when you were younger, that you were pushed and pushed hard and did you feel challenged by it? No, I, I never did. And interestingly, looking back, the thing that was actually so powerful was left to my own devices without a coach that was standing back, I would have probably done stuff at too early an age that would have certainly meant I wasn't still competing internationally at the age of 34. Right. But were you, did you feel that you were pushed? Were you no. pushed? No. Okay. No, because I, I, I wonder what I you ever felt that. No. no, because I wondered if you were, because of your father's background, because of breaking the orthodoxy and challenging yeah. the establishment, it would require a certain type of fortitude and outlook. Do, do you think that the resilience of athletes in this day and age is different than it was in your day and age? That's a great question. And I don't, no, I don't know there's an easy answer to that. I don't think pressure in the sport comes from anything that is, I tend to think it's internally generated, mm, but then I'm probably speaking. In any sport, I think that's the same. I'm probably only speaking for myself here. Uh, culturally, we've shifted. And a lot of emphasis, I suppose some of it even more so post-COVID, is about mental resilience yeah. and fortitude and overcoming things. And I grew up, with a father that was very much get on with it mentality. Yeah. He'd been a professional footballer. I'd signed for Chelsea, your team, when I was 14, 15. And my background was get on with it, overcome things. Things are things you have, you've got to overcome. Yeah. Um, and I wondered, without looking for you to be controversial, but I wondered if you looked into the world of athletics and with your experiences and the athletes that you competed against, the, the period of time that you were involved in and all the experiences that you have, are you seeing a different mental resilience in athletics than, than, than what you encountered when you were younger? Yeah, I, th there's no question that there is that. And I think there's a, a, a far greater willingness and openness to talk about some of those challenges that wasn't on the agenda when I was a, a competitor. I mean, luckily, look, if you're lucky and you have a great coach, most great coaches are pretty good psychologists mm -hmm. and will... And the great thing about coaching is, and my father was the first to admit this, he said, you need to know, you need to have all the technical ability to do it, but actually fundamentally, you need to know more about the people you're working with than the, it's not just simply imparting, you know, how do you bend a ball into the back mm. of the net or, you know, what angle do you come into a high jump apron at? And it's, it's a great deal more than just simply imparting technical stuff. Again, you know, you've got to, you have to choose your words carefully here, but I, I just worry sometimes that we're, we've just flicked the pendulum a little bit mm. too far that, you know, we, we openly talk about mental welfare and that's important. You're right. And Indeed. that's been turbocharged yeah. mm. after, after COVID. And we know that there have been some, some big challenges, both in my sport and, and more broadly. But I, I hope that we don't lose sight of the fact that, that, that to make it to the very highest level, which is an honorable ambition, it's, it, it's not, 
you know, it, it's not a shameful thing to want to be the best. Indeed. But I think you've got a generation of coaches that are now having to coach under very, very difficult circumstances. The, the, how do you define to an athlete that, you know, there may be a weight issue here? You can't have those discussions anymore. I know there are there are many coaches who just say, look, it's coaching females is is a very, very complex challenge now, much more so than it's ever been. I think in many respects it's brought out the best in a young generation of coaches, but I think of the kind of conversation. In what way? Making them I think more rounded? I think they've become more sensitive to these right. issues. I think it's probably made them better coaches. But you can't lose that rough edge. Hmm. I mean, I, rem I had a... It's the drive, isn't it? I, I, well, I, I always remember fondly because it made me laugh. I mean, it was a sort of, it was almost a, a, a minder-esque uh, exchange. But... I had a lovely coach who worked in my in the backroom team that my dad managed from Harringay Athletic Club, good northeast London, a guy called John Havell. He had a fruit and veg market. And I remember being at Harringay a few weeks before the LA Games, and I'd had a really difficult build up and I'd fallen out with the media for all sorts of reasons. And he watched me training with a group and he just walked over and he said to me, I I just, I'm not sure that you're really focusing on what's coming up. And I said, well, he said, I said, you know, and he went, no, no, no. He said, it's really important. He said, he said, I think maybe a little less of the sang froid and a little bit more of the fucking panic. <laughs> <laughs> You're four weeks off an Olympic Games. Get your ass in gear. And I got, I, I absolutely got that. And then I also remember an exchange with an athlete who was very, very talented. And the guy came up to him and said, oh, I don't want to work with you anymore. It's a clash of personalities. And he went, he looked at him and said, yeah. He said, you've got all the clash and I've got all the personality. personality. Fuck off. <laughs> now, you know, I'm not saying that we want to revert to that, mm. but, but there were balanced. conversations yeah. Yeah. that coaches could have with athletes. Frank exchange of views. That were frank. Yeah. And now it's a very, very different uh, it's a very, very But that worries landscape. me. I mean, I, I look, I think there are things in society that need to evolve and everything changes and every generation has a different viewpoint. People are talking about this particular generation as a generation that they're troubled by, but I think every generation looks at the previous generation and goes, well, I didn't do that and I wouldn't have done it this way. But I do worry about resilience in society. I do worry about the preparedness of people to be able to do what it takes to overcome adversity rather than disappear into a victim culture or a prepare or a propensity to find a reason why they can't well, achieve something. And also, I don't want to cheapen in a way, I'm going to probably get into trouble for saying this, I don't want to cheapen mental well-being because it is, it's thrown out a lot. I agree. And, you know, I've, I agree. one of my closest friends went through three years of deep, deep depression. Mm. I, I know what that is like to witness. I've Mercifully, seen it myself, yeah. I haven't, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm lucky. I, you know, I've had my good days and bad days, but I know what that is about. I was talking to Alistair Campbell not long ago. Yeah. And we were he both, suffers from that, doesn't he? We were both yeah. agreeing about that. Yeah. Now, I think it's great that we feel more, with a greater level of permission to talk yeah. about it. And awareness, but, of course, but, as a result I, of it. I, I, I don't want it to become almost the default position. Well, it because diminishes. athletes going through that are yeah. going to, you know, you are going to have better days in the office than, yeah. than not. And yeah. you're going to have worse days in the office. And it's got to be about navigating yeah. that. Managing your way through that. And where there are mental, you know, we we, we know from cricket, we know from some sports, yeah. there have been some really yeah. well, profound cases. Well, we've and, seen Marcus Triscothic and we've seen Jonathan Trump. And that's what you focus yeah. on. Yeah. I don't want what they've been through to to have a to, sort of linguistic... Yeah, I agree. Uh, I don't want yeah. that currency to be devalued. No, I agree. You know, for me as well, one of my close friends was Terry Hall, the late, late great singer of the specials, who yeah. suffered from clinical depression. Yeah. And when you've seen it, sometimes people are suffering from 
a circumstance in life, like a relationship is broken up or they haven't got what they want. And I worry that then that becomes a mental, a mental, an obligation upon mental well-being and health rather than a preparedness to overcome adversity in that moment. Yeah. And I feel that sometimes we disappear into it. Actually, if you look at the Paralympic Games yeah. and you look at what many of those competitors... The challenges they have to overcome. They've overcome either from mm. birth or yeah. through to that traumatic moment yeah. where they've lost control of a motorbike or something. Yeah. And, you know, two years later... And some of us don't know we're born. Two years later, they're, you know, weightlifting and for Team absolutely, GB. Absolutely. And I, I think that is a... You know, and they've been through some extraordinary moments, but I think that in many respects is a template that we've not properly mm. tapped mm. Uh, uh, across sport. And mm. Some of those stories are, I mean, they're jaw dropping. Indeed, indeed. I'm going to move you on to one of the key facets that people will associate with you, not the only one, but one of them, which is your achievements and your rivalry and the, the nature of the um, circumstances between yourself and Steve Ovitz. Well, Do you think having Ovitz around yes. have made you better? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I wouldn't have admitted it at the time. No. But no question. Why? <clears throat> because, Why wouldn't you admit it at the time? Because I got the question all the time yeah. and I used to come out. You're not going to give him any credence? No, I wouldn't. No, it wasn't even that. I just, we all came, we both came out with the, the, the sort of pat, no, well, we only worry about, you know, each guy. <laughs> Every game at a time, we only worry about what we're doing. Oh, delusional. Of course we were. We were always thinking You were about mindful it. of the other. Yeah. I remember being on 79, 80, Christmas Day. I went out at a 13-mile run, effectively uphill from, get geography on you, but you know, the Hope Valley in, in just outside Sheffield. Long run through sort of Wagnerian weather, the snow. It was, and I remember sitting... <laughs> sitting down for Christmas lunch and feeling vaguely uneasy during the afternoon. And halfway through the, uh, the 900 and running of the dam busters or something. And I remember <laughs> Battle thinking, of the bulge, yeah. I bet you anything he's out doing a second training session. <laughs> and I sort of obsessionally went upstairs, put my kit back on and ran another five or six miles. And in a rare moment of candor, Years later, I was looking after his son at the Commonwealth Games when he was working for Channel 7 in 2005, 2006 in Melbourne. And Freddie, who ran for Australia, was sitting there. He said, well, what was it like to run against my dad? And what was it like? You know, and he was fascinated. Anyway, Steve joined us after the broadcast had finished. And I said to him, Steve, I'm going to admit something to you about what I did on Christmas Day in the lead up to the Games. And he sort of smiled and then looked at me and said, did you only go out twice that day? 30-something <laughs> years later. So, yeah, of course, he was a huge figure in my mm. career. Who do you think was the better between you and him? Well, in the 800 in Moscow, immeasurably him because he was mentally tougher. Mm. Uh, he gripped the race and he had more experience. And I had only myself to blame, but I take nothing away from him. You don't get lucky and win an Olympic title. Mm. I then had two or three days to regroup, look into the abyss. And I always remember thinking, right, you haven't done what you've done for the last 10 years to go home empty handed here. So for the 1500 meters, I, the only thing that drove me was it wasn't really whether I won on the day, although clearly I wanted to. It was, I never wanted to walk off a track feeling so, that I'd so fallen below what I mm. knew I was capable. I was a world record holder. Mm. I'd run three seconds slower than, than my world record. Well, you've done three records in 40, three world yeah, records in 41 exactly. days. So. Prob prob in, in hindsight, that probably wasn't the smartest mm. way to go into a championship because for a lot of people, because it's just a matter of hanging yeah. a medal around your yeah. neck, that you're a world record holder. It doesn't work like that. And I was, I'm just, I always smile at this story because after the 800, everybody had a view about what I needed to do in the mm. 1500 meters. And it was in the old days where journalists could actually walk, effectively walked into the village. So after the 800, yeah, I had an absolutely nightmare press conference. You know, it was just, you know, I was. I think the lead on the front page of the News of the World the following day was a photograph of me running 
it was Coe's Trail of Shame. It was a silver medal. Right. Mm. And that not that didn't really bother me that much. But, you know, I sort of had to regroup. And a whole group of journalists sitting there and some of them were saying, you've got to run from the front. Others saying, you know, you fight, you got to... They really wanted me to, mm. to do well. And my old man sat there very patiently watching this. And he started life as a mathematician. So numbers, he couldn't understand anybody that didn't get numbers. And he sat there and halfway through, <laughs> through these journos imparting all the, inf the, you know, their advice. Particular brands of wisdom, yeah. He pulled out an old piece of paper which you always travel with, an old propelling pencil. And it, it was like watching a sort of electric stenographer. Well, these numbers were flying around the pencil, like that. And then after about three or four minutes, he stuck the thing in his pocket and then he went, right, thank you. Um, I just need time with my athlete. Never referred to me as his son. It was always my athlete. And when they disappeared, he looked at me and he pulled this paper out and he went, you know, this isn't complicated. Looking at all these numbers, he said, given the number of mistakes you made uh, over the distance that you made them and the frequency with which you made them. There was only one outcome. He you said, weren't going to win. He said, it is well nigh statistically impossible for you to fuck up that badly again in the <laughs> okay. next decade. <laughs> and that, Simon, I swear to God, that was the only team talk mm. that I had. And the rest of it, he looked at me and he said, you know enough. And the night before the 800 meter final, I, it was unusual. I can sleep. If you, if I said I wanted to go to sleep, I could lie on that floor and probably be asleep in three minutes. It's just one of those things I can do. I didn't sleep that night. And when I got down into the Olympic village, the restaurant the following morning, uh, I remember dropping the milk and I was just, <clears throat> and I remember, and he said to me, I didn't know whether to say something at that moment and introduce maybe something into your head that may not have been there. Right. Or actually to say something um, and, you know, risk that or say nothing. And I talked to Eddie Jones about that and Eddie Jones said, your father has picked up on probably the most complicated coaching scenario. When do you say something and when don't you say something? And to his dying day, he will always say to me, the only regret he ever had in his career, a judgment other, call other than I didn't win the Tour de France, was he was a cyclist, was that I should have said something. And maybe we could have teased out the night before. Mm. I'm not sure, actually, it would have still been enough to have beaten Steve. Because Eddie Jones day. talks about, I spoke to Eddie, he's been on this, and spoke yep. about that that high that he took the athletes to in the semi-final. Yep. And he needed to have brought them down. And his yep. reflection upon that was, is I needed to have taken a different approach during that build-up to the final and took them down a level um, because they were too high and they weren't going to be able to get back to the high. So I needed to reduce them down to get back up to yeah. that high again. Yeah. So that's what his thought process on that. And yeah. your father's... Well, it was the reverse. Yeah. Because he had yeah. to, you know, <clears throat> you we up. both had to, mm -hmm. we both had to pick ourselves up. And then, you know, the 1500 was a... Was How a... close were you not to not go to that? I mean, obviously we talk about the Moscow Olympics yeah. and the boycotting of it. And I, I'm aware through the research that I've done that you were, there was pressure being put on you. Mm. Uh, political pressure, which is an interesting one, and we'll get onto that in terms of your role in certain yeah. things that are going on at this moment in time. But how close were you not to not going and being part of a boycott? I think quite close, um, and I, I'm eternally indebted. Why? Oh, I mean, you're very single-minded. Yes. So, but I mean, if you think about what happened, I mean, we were all sailing along into Christmas of '79. Mm -hmm. Russia walks into Afghanistan. I was studying effects of economics and international at, at university. And I sort of looked at this and thought, oh, this is, this is inevitably going to have a knock-on effect. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it started. Margaret had only been prime minister for a short period of time. She was very into building back the special relationship she felt had, With the US, of, yeah. that had dissipated a bit under the yeah. previous government uh, and when <clears throat> jimmy carter announced the boycott i just sensed well it was inevitable it was only a matter of days before she came in behind it and then it started uh, and it was a very divisive argument in the uk 
You know, there were those that thought we should go. There were those that thought we shouldn't. My father actually got invited in to see a young foreign office minister. And he went and the guy said to him, in no uncertain terms. Douglas thought, Hood, yeah. Yeah, mm. it was Douglas Hood who went on to be Foreign Secretary. Interesting, I became his whip when I was in government. Right, okay. I reminded him of this exchange. It's actually in the 30-year papers that my father went in. Right. And he said to, literally they said, would you, you know, can you quiet him down? Because, you know, he's, he's running quite a good campaign here. And he went, my father looked at him, he was pretty contemptuous of politicians. He said... He's just done a degree in economics and history. I think he can probably figure this out for himself. And the exchange is actually <laughs> the exchange is 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 on the on the record. And so there was a lot of pressure. And then young athletes were sent sort of photographs of mutilated yep. Afghan kids. Yeah. It it got really unpleasant. And actually one newspaper made up a complete story about me in Oslo at an athletics event where I was supposed to, that night in the hotel, have been drunk and disorderly and throwing food around, complete. And it was a part, it, and it was, you know, part of, a, 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 you know, an attempted... Discrediting. Yeah, mm. it, exactly. What was, I mean, what was your, prefer, your, your preferred race? Was it the 800 metres or was it, was it the 1500? I, I actually preferred to run the 800. Yeah. Although I didn't, I won two titles, but not an Olympic title yeah. at it. 1500 is what I tend to get remembered mm. for because of the, yeah. but I actually think I was probably on balance a better 800 meter runner than a 1500 right. meter. It suited me. I liked inflicting pain in a race and I could do that at eight more than I could do at 15. Right. The 800 is the toughest event on the track. It is the most complicated. Right. I would say that, wouldn't I? But it's the only race outside of relays that starts in lanes. After 100 meters, you then have to converge. So if you're in lane eight or nine, you've got to be knowing what's going on way, way behind. If you're in lane one or two, you don't want everybody piling in on you. And and you're running world-class pace. You're running an average of 19, 20 miles an hour the whole way. You can only absorb about 20% of the oxygen you need. It's like high-speed chess. Mm. You're per it's like being on the M25 on a Friday night. You're watching for brake lights. And you have always to think, at, at that speed, what is my exit route here? If the athlete three ahead decides to go in or out, how do I go? Do I have to go to the back of the field? Or... And so I think it demands more skills and more specific disciplines than right. any other event because you need to be, you need to have the leg speed now of a good world-class 400 meter runner. You need to be able to do your mileage, your 10, your 15 miles on the road. And I think it's 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 the toughest amalgam. You can make mistakes at the 15. I've made them and bounce back. Yeah. You make one mistake at you're 800 gone. metres, yeah. you're out of the yeah. back door. Do you value your silvers? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I mean, Ben I'm... Whitaker famously this year and uh, the last so in the last Olympics, uh, the boxer who will be a, a remarkable talent as a professional. Yeah. I'm watching him. Did ha had no regard for his silver. Pretty much threw it away. And I wondered, given that you, you know in '84 you go again. You win a gold again in the 1500, but again, you get a silver in the 800. And I just wondered if you... <laughs> I probably have the luxury of valuing them more because I got the golds yeah. than had they just yeah. been sitting out there mm. as the sum total of my career. And mm. I realise I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky to do that. I want to move you on to the Olympics and your new roles in life. Now, moving off from mm. being an athlete, still maintaining the fact that you were a runner in yeah. life. Um, I won't let you forget that. No, nope, neither should you. Um, but I want to talk about the, the, the sort of the legacy of the Olympics and their relevance in this day and age. You know, obviously now you're you're the president of World Athletics, formerly the IAAF, but now I think more appropriately titled World Athletics. Yeah. How would you assess the state of play and the health of the Games? We're coming into another Olympic year in Paris next year. What's your overall view of the state of play? I think, well, if I'm... I'm a, take a bit more of a local interest here. I think the state of athletics is strong. It's never been stronger. We've got if, more young talent coming right. through. Our world championships were exceptional this year. And people, you know, for a few weeks, people were talking about us, not football. I mean, we know that's a, that is a sort of magnesium flair, mm. but you make the very most of it. I think the Olympic Games is going to have to look very closely 
at itself and what the future of the games is. I'm a fundamental believer. I've spent the larger, by a distance, the larger part of my world and life in the Olympic movement as a competitor, as a you know, somebody who's worked in the in the movement and deliverer of an Olympic Games, and you know now I'm the number one Olympic sport. But I think it's inevitable. It's going to have to re-engineer itself. The, the look, you know, I'm choosing my words carefully, but there are a lot of sports that are going to have to look at themselves, look at their broadcast relationships, mm -hmm. and do things differently, and around governances as well. Mm -hmm. Look, my my period my period at World Athletics was, you know, when I started, I'd been campaigning for a year and a half to get the job. Mm -hmm. I'd been in in our headquarters in Monaco no more than uh, well a few days. I'd taken a break at the end of the campaign, and I got elected in the World Championships in 2015 in um, in Beijing, and I remember sitting in my I'd only been in the office two days. And my receptionist walked in and he said, uh, there are some people to see you in the, in the reception. And I said, oh, yeah, okay, thinking, well, it's a Monegasque, you know, courtesy, maybe a piece of cake and some champagne. And I walked out, there were about 20 people there. 15 of them were French police, head of Monaco police, two Interpol, and a guy who, who introduced himself as Judge Renaud Van Renbeck. Mm -hmm. who said he was the uh, chief prosecuting judge in France for cross-border corruption. Right. Five hours later in a Monaco police station, I'm being told that my predecessor had been arrested that morning arriving in Paris. Yeah, yeah. His son was on the run. The head of testing, anti-doping, uh, was arrested. The legal counsel had been arrested. <clears throat> and I'd received a message a couple of days earlier, which I thought was a tad bizarre, from my CEO announced he was going backpacking in Australia. So it wasn't the opening paragraph of an obviously happy ending, mm. but it did give me the opportunity to then take a flamethrower to the organization. Yeah, I was going to say, when what did you inherit? Because very you, little. Yeah. I mean, select committees. Yeah. <laughs> interview, but, I mean, it was a pretty what is horrid it? time. What is it, Seb, about these organizations that, that seem to, draw corruption and bad practice and challenges when they're supposed to be representing sports. We've seen it with FIFA. We've seen it with UEFA. We, we now, we've now seen this with DIAC and the challenges around the Russian doping mm. and mm. illicit payments. Mm. What, what is it about these organizations that are allowing or, or creating this opportunity? Look, you're right. And we, we do need to discuss this, but I guess if I, were to make a case for the defense here, I would say, and and I think you'd agree with me, the challenge sport has, of course, is that look, you've got a business background. Mm -hmm. You're one of a few people that would probably wade through a 40 paragraph investigative piece about the management of a business or an institution in a Sunday newspaper. Mm -hmm. Most people don't because they don't really understand the nuances and it's not within their framework of mm -hmm. reference. If it has sport attached to it, they recognize the names, they recognize the sport and they'll plow on into the article. Now, I'm not remotely condoning the lack of governances that most sports until relatively recently have, have, have not had. All this is going on. I mean, you're the vice president. And from 2007 yeah. onwards. And it's a good question. It's like me being a managing director. Yeah. And my, and my finance director yeah. is not aware of some of the issues yeah. financially that are going on. That would be almost like, well, hang on. You're but the Simon, director. you're putting that in a business context right. and you would have every justification for asking that. But remember, in sport, you didn't. we didn't have those structures. You have an executive, you know, you, you're a vice president. You probably meet four times a year. Right. So... And, and then you've got the challenge of questions that you may or may not be asking as an ordinary board member. If you get a yes or a no, you can't, there's no framework by which you can say, well, how do I, I know well, that's the case. Mm -hmm. So in simple terms, in, in, in the, what was the IAAF, you had too much power 
residing in the hands of too few people right. and no way of being able to cross index mm. the veracity uh, of, of the answers that you were given. So when I took the role, there were three questions I asked myself. The first was, how do we make decisions that are clear and transparent mm -hmm. so that the... And have accountability. The, have the, the chair of the athletics club in Croydon knows that when my council makes a decision, why we've made it, mm -hmm. the way the decision is, is relayed, you've got to cut the undergrowth out and let them be able to see what, why you've made that judgment. The second question, and it's a tougher one, and sport is going to have to ask it, and we did, is who the hell do you want in your sport? What are their motivations? Yeah. What, what is the integrity here? And then you have to ask yourself a third question, which you can't really answer until you've dealt with the first two, which is, well, how do you then grow the sport? How, do it, how does it remain salient, interesting, relevant in the lifestyles of young people? Mm -hmm. And that's not a competition with other sports. That's a competition with the entertainment mm -hmm. world, you know, all the other demands mm -hmm. that, you know, young people have, and that's a good thing. So we rewrote the constitution. We created something called the Athletic Integrity Union. I've seen that, yeah. And that took away, that made entirely independent and anonymous testing. Mm -hmm. So never again would we have a federation that was able to put political pressure on a group of people at the headquarters to either slow down a process. We took all that out. So Simon, at this very moment, I would probably be only given six, seven hours notice as president of the sport if they ban a big name athlete. Right. I wouldn't begin to know what they're doing. They're in a separate unit. I can't even walk in to that unit. Right. We have a good working relationship, but it's independent. And it really and so athletics has now and the athletes have now got used to the fact it doesn't really matter about the size of your federation or the geopolitical situation or even reputation. You want to step outside the rules, you're going to get caught. Yeah. And you're going to get treated, if you're American or British, you're going to get treated in exactly the way the how athlete are from you? Cook I mean, Islands is going to get how treated. How worried are you about doping in your sport? I mean, I saw the statistics of 2,779 tests and 304, I think I'm right, and perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, with 349 athletes uh, having adverse findings, which in the plainest speak to me says 12% of tests are coming up with ad adverse findings. We're seeing it. I, I see it in other sports. I see the ridiculous approach in this country, say to the boxing industry with the UCAD, um, not having the resources to test properly yet being the governing body. You seem to have tackled that head on. Yeah, as one of your sort of core cornerstones of your manifesto and, and, and ideals about where your sport should be. It had to be. Does it worry you? Do you feel that? I mean, we talk about. I talk to boxing for, uh, yeah. boxers and the British Boxing Board of Control, and they believe that it, that doping is rife in their sports. Yeah. What, what do you feel about your sports? <clears throat> I feel we're in much safer territory. Will we ever get to the utopia of? Uh, of, a, of, a, of a sport that is drug free. 100 percent clean, yeah. No, of course no. not, because it's human nature. You know, it's risk or reward. And and look, again, you you need to choose your words carefully here. But if you're a street kid in some countries, the risk reward is huge. Mm. And if and if you get caught and you're returned to the street, sadly, that's probably not as nothing big. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you've got the challenges because when you're putting education programs together you, in, a, in a sport that is true, there are only two truly global sports. I'm probably going to get shot down for saying mm -hmm. this. It's football and track and field. You know, our world championships mm -hmm. is, you know, we have 211, was 213, 211 countries now. But football and track and field, they are the two true global sports they're done everywhere yeah fair enough, and it's yeah. the universal yeah. language commercially not so but no for, for, for commercially absolutely no, no. Yeah. football is yeah. the, the well, i don't need yeah. to tell you yeah, i absolutely. mean it is you know it it not only pays the piper it calls the tune and absolutely. then occasionally rewrites the symphony i mean it's Indeed. it's in control yeah. but we i think we're in much better territory we now have the systems in place and look 
I, d I would rather not have to spend eight million a year mm -hmm. on an integrity unit doing this, but I also but it is know what it is. It is. I would rather have the short term embarrassment of a of a test that is a positive test and even maybe a high profile test than I'd have the genteel decline into the morality of the knackers mm -hmm. yard where, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, you lose control. And I, what I don't want, uh, for me, I never want, I didn't want my sport to end up like WWF or whatever mm -hmm. it's called, where everybody knows it's fake and worse than that, nobody cares. While people are saying they have a problem with it, I know we're still on the right side of that moral What do you make bandit. of this, this, um Fellow D'Souza suggesting the enhanced games, making a case for it. I mean, I've had him on talking on him show, and I I wanted to shoot him down in flames. And you find yourself listening to him, and you find yourself going, "Well, I, I abhor the idea," but there's something about it that kind of makes some perverse, horrific sense. I don't think it does, and I'm not sure I really particularly want to go down that road. Give it any but... credence. Well, no, because nobody in my sport takes that seriously. And the athletes are now, and I speak to them regularly, we've just had our Athlete of the Year Award. So I've sat, I've sat down with all our winners this year for two or three days. And first of all, they have a great deal more confidence in the system. Secondly, they want to be in an environment. And for me, you know, weeding out the cheats isn't just because I feel good that we've we've caught a cheat. For me, it's actually about protecting the clean athletes. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of athletes and coaches want to do it with integrity. And they don't want to sit there thinking, well, everything I'm doing is probably going to come to nothing because well, there's his, a, his there argument are, is there are a better it? set of chemists in lane five yeah. than, than in the lane I'm in. Well, his argument of it as, as, as enhanced games is that it is rife in the sport. It, well, it isn't. And, that's your, and that, your pushback would be that. And that athletes aren't tested, so it gives them actually more level playing field than the current one that we're on. And the athletes are tested, and they're tested all the time. Mm. So I can tell you that no athlete went to the World Championships in the testing pool in Budapest that wasn't tested at least three times, right. four times in out the, of competition. In, well, and in the in the four months lead up to it. Yeah. How damaging was Alberto Salazar? It was a bad story. And look, I'm, I'm not going to be mealy mouthed about this. Mm. Alberto is a friend of mine. I've known him for years. We competed at the same time. I've known Alberto. He's a coach who was like a lot of coaches, is a bit crazy. He's messianic. He was always, ch pre you know, challenging the envelope. Um, I, the honest answer to that, Simon, though, isn't it? I don't know. We could have done without it, and I know it's it's you know it, it, there's not a lot left in his life. Mm. Disappointing though, isn't it? All those stories are mm. disappointing. Of course they are. Can I ask you, Sib, why why you thought it wasn't a conflict of interest for you to be a Nike ambassador and yet be a very influential, first of all, a vice president at the IAAF? And then the president of the IWAF, which is now World Athletics. Why why did you feel it wasn't a conflict? Because it feels to me like it most likely is. I don't think it was a conflict, but that's always going to be a nuanced discussion. Look, my history is a pretty clear one. I was the first Nike athlete to win a global title or win a global medal in their shoes. Mm -hmm. I was with them from 1978 onwards. Uh, I'd even been on the advisory board for a few years. I'd taken on roles and responsibilities. Phil Knight, the owner. But the optics set. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I know opti get optics it. is shit. I know but, that sometimes we but, look at the world through optics and but, say, come on, it's yeah. people looking glass. No, no, you're right. And I guess the other element for me in all that is during the London years, I still had that same role and responsibility. Adidas became our partners. The legal global council came into me one day and she said, we've now got the RFP out there for uh, the, the kit sponsorship. Mm. She said, you will exit every meeting where this is discussed. Six months later, I'd even forgotten. Nike never discussed it with me. She never discussed it with me. And she walked in and she said, by the way, last night we signed with Adidas. Yes, you're right. I probably should have seen going forward 
But having been through that for seven years with nobody making any observations mm. at all. But you're stepping up to the big seat now, weren't you? Well, I'm not sure it's bigger than chairing an organizing committee for an Olympic Games. Okay. And for seven years, there was not a word, nobody even mentioned it. And it was properly managed, it was properly coordinated. And I guess, look, it's an easy thing for you to sit, for me to sit there and say, well, I was never going to abuse that position. I never would have done, I never did. You're right. I probably should have seen that going to World Athletics and the linkage between a company that was so synonymous mm -hmm. with athletics, I should have got, but I made, I was very clear that I was going to, I had to review everything I did when I got the World Athletics job and I stepped down. I got the job in September. I was off the board at Nike by and the ambassador role at the end of October. Mm. You mentioned 2012 or you touched upon it. Um, how do you look back on that? I mean, did it fulfill? I mean, you get you get various reports, don't you? You talk <clears> about <throat> the cost implications of it. It was originally budgeted at 2.4 billion, ended up costing 8 billion, which is often the case when you get government involved in certain things. And you know, the building of the Olymp of the uh, Wembley Stadium was originally forecast at 200 million, ended up at 757 million. Do you look back on it besides your innate pride um, for having been absolutely fundamental to achieving it? And the value of sport in this country, I think, is often much maligned mm. and misunderstood. But do you yeah. look back at this overall picture well, and look, go, what did we achieve besides a, a wonderful Super Saturdays, wonderful stuff from Greg Rutherford, yeah. wonderful stuff from Jessica uh, and a variety of other athletes? The operating budget for the Olympic Games never altered. Right. And I was responsible for that. Okay. The infrastructural budget was an entirely separate budget. So that's the moving faces. It? It's the one thing that people f overlook. The organizing committee is a private business. Uh, when we became the organizing committee, we were a bid committee. There were 60 people. The first job I had with the CEO was going to Barclays and taking an overdraft of about 50 million to create the business. There's not a penny of government money goes into the operational budget, which was what I was responsible for. That's the local organizing committee. And that budget was 2.34. It never altered, never moved. And 50%, 25% of that is made up for your ticket sales. Mm -hmm. A big chunk of that is your ability to bring local partners to the table, yep. your, you know, sponsors, your, yeah. your yeah. BMWs, yeah. your you know, Lloyd's banks, yeah, yeah. commercial BPs, sponsors, yeah. all that. And that is an entirely separate budget. The problem is that if you really want to conflate everything, which is in accounting terms, just ridiculous, you then throw in the infrastructural budget. Infrastructural budget never altered. It was seven and bits, uh, two point something on top for contingency. Government always throws in a lot of contingency. Yeah. And, and that came in on time and slightly under budget. So actually, and this is your big challenge. People then throw the two budgets together, which is crazy. And the infrastructural budget then suddenly becomes a cost. Now, I don't know how you would view this. I don't sit there going, well, that hospital is costs that much. You think, well, that's probably an investment Yes, in primary, course. secondary, or yeah. tertiary healthcare, mm -hmm. and actually building a school is really not, it's what you need to do. So in a way, what happened, and it's it was an easily sort of a bit tabloidy, if you really wanted to say this thing, the whole thing was out of control, you took the oper operating budget, you threw it into the infrastructural budget, and you said, well, it's all become, it's yeah. gone from two point something. There were two different budgets. Two, two entirely separate budgets. But also there's I mean, the flip side of the economic benefit is that it's been reported that the benefits are up to 14 billion and far ahead of cycles in previous Olympics. And they were actually. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we got everything right. I think if you look at the impact that it had on elite sport was dramatic. We were the first city or the first country to get more medals in the next away games in Rio yeah. than we got in London. If you look at the impact, um, or I'm probably a bit biased here, but if you look at the participation impact that the games, particularly from 2008, had, 
in Beijing on our participation numbers, you know, we were hemorrhaging participation. Now, the best you can, the worst case scenario is that we staunch that bleeding. Mm. If you look at the sports that I think will make are making a difference to the health and well-being of the population, then those numbers would dramatically increase. Chris Hoy, Victoria Pendleton, off the back of two thousand eight, have more some two more mil, two million more cyclists in that four year cycle. Pun went you know took took to the roads. More runners now mm-hmm. than ever before. Park run, triathlons. So all those sports that actually are having a physiological improvement in in health and well-being actually did quite well well. i quote you yeah because what you said was what i'm disappointed about school sport school sport became a political football we could have done more off the back of the games and we should have done and the one thing that i take some pride from and i guess it's my political background is i did manage to keep party politics out of the games Mm -hmm. In 2005, when the well, evaluation in an election year was the same year we had to get across the line in Singapore to, to get the games, I managed to persuade all three political parties to put exactly the same paragraph in their manifestos, because I knew that over seven years with prime ministers coming and going, mayors coming and going, you know, political structures, I wanted everybody to remember what they'd signed up to. And I didn't need to prompt that. You know, Tessa Jowell, who was magnificent in helping us do what we did, was the Secretary of State when we won the bid. She was the Secretary of State until Labour went out of government in 2010, but she stayed on the Olympic board and was a really responsible person who helped with the games. Mm -hmm. And Hugh Robertson and and, um, Jeremy Hunt, were opposition who came in and ended up as ministers running and helping uh, deliver the games. And it was a grown up, it was a grown up political scene. The one thing I got disappointed in was I didn't understand why school sport towards the end became such a political football. Mm-hmm. The school the, the, the school sports partnerships got broken up for no good reason. I spent the next two years after the games piecing together the damage that was done overnight. And it was done off the back of the austerity packages Mm -hmm. that came through in 2010. And we've never really recovered from that. And the, 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 the sadness for me is if you look, if we go right back to where we started this conversation, it started for me in a school. It probably started for you in a school Mm -hmm. in sport. It's the, you know, it's the inspirational geography teacher that taught me for track and field. Absolutely right. And if you haven't got that embedded, yep. it's very difficult to get those patterns of exercise. If you haven't got them at 8, 9, 10, 11, yeah. then trying to get An opportunity 15, 16-year-old yeah. kids to absolutely do that right. is hopeless. And I think we went back, not forward on that. Do you, do you look at the infrastructure, putting aside it was a separate budget, are you disappointed to see that the infrastructure, say, for example, what I call the taxpayer stadium, West Ham Stadium, um, and look at that and say, well, that they're, they're going to they're gonna phase athletics out of that stadium. And that wasn't... We don't know that for sure yet. Well, the likelihood is. Well, we don't so. know that for sure. But look, what, I, what would I say? Look, the, the principle at a Games is simple. If you can't... If you haven't got a legacy tenant and a really sensible plan going forward, do not build permanently. Mm. We didn't have a 50 meter swimming pool in London. I mean, you've probably got six or seven in Paris. Mm -hmm. We had a 50 meter swimming pool that was slightly shy of 50 meters at Crystal Palace. And the cynics actually suggested that it was left slightly shy of 50 meters, so they didn't have to foot the bill for international competition. (laughs) That's probably a bit conspiratorial. You know, we were a nation of cyclists and we'd done what we'd done historically. We didn't have a covered velodrome in London. So if you look at the Olympic Park, we only actually built what we didn't have. You're a Londoner. Mm -hmm. Londoner, London as a sports city was singularly badly served for those types of facilities. Mm -hmm. Then if you can't build permanently because you haven't got a legacy tenant, then build temporary. I mean, everybody said, oh, I had to build a... Uh, a, a permanent um, water polo venue. And I said, look, in the best will in the world, 
I'm sure people will get into water polo for a few days. Yeah, but in London. But that, yeah. we're not going to become a nation of water polo players. No, we're not. So we built we built perm we built temporary and where where we were able to use existing venues like Wembley and and the O2, then then use those. And that actually again was pretty much a template. I want to talk to you about this current landscape with Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. And the recent IOC announcement um, that Russian and Belarusian athletes um, who've qualified for the 24 Olympics will be allowed to participate as neutrals. Do you agree with that premise? Well, the, the, the honest answer is, is, is no, although I respect international federations for making individual judgments. Look, I, I can't have it both ways. You know, I, I'm a great believer that sport needs to be independent and mm. autonomous, and you make judgments that you think are in the best interest of your sport. So uh, not every international federation has taken that view. We took a different view. Um, and remember, we, we Russia was suspended from 2015 for yeah, doping. For doping, yeah. And we looked at the landscape when Russia walked into Ukraine. And for us, it was about the integrity of competition. Mm -hmm. And I just, my counsel, I certainly, I couldn't remain a neutral on it. I'd, Simon, I'd sat with at the European Championships in Munich. I went to talk to the Ukraine team because they were under, you know, the war had started. And when I walked in to speak to them, the head coach came over to me and said, by the way, there's a girl in that group whose mother died four hours ago in a mm. tower block. I couldn't be neutral. But it, but it feels, I mean, listen, I understand and 185, that. And it would have been the same. 185 of them lost their lives. But it would have been the same in 1980, wouldn't it, in some respect? I mean, it feels to me there's like an element, a touch of hypocrisy here. Because as the runner that you are, in 1980, you're a runner and you're rejecting a political agenda. Yet in 2023, you're a runner that is an administrator that's now enforcing a political agenda. I don't think we were enforcing a political agenda. Some might look at it that way. We looked at this very much as the integrity of the competition. Could, I, could we as a council sit there and say we would give to Russia and Belarus the panoply of service and world championship environment when the country that had been invaded weren't able to compete properly, didn't have infrastructure, had athletes having to compete yeah, out I'm, of the country, yeah, I understand that. had male coaches mm -hmm. who were on the front, 185 male athletes have lost their lives defending their country. Have we set a precedent? Yes, we have. And I have to accept that. I'm not really very good at the what about argument. I think you have to deal with what is in front of you. And yeah, yeah I agree there that are what about is a low in... form of conversation, but it is also relevant at times. Yeah, it is. Because we have to have consistency. You can't, but what, what about you? If, you, if you, if I allow you to have that observation, it enables you to get away from your core principles of what you believed once. I know that what's the purpose of a mind if you can't change it, right? But your fundamentals were a certain view as an athlete, and if you were an athlete now, a Belarusian, how would you be sat in this circumstances? Well, look, I have been through that in a different era. I chose not to go to South Africa. Right. I chose not to go to South Africa for the very simple reason that I knew that if I went, I wouldn't be competing against the best that they had available in the apartheid years. I also have Indian background, so I'd have rather face the wrath of Margaret Thatcher than the wrath of my mother or <laughs> my, my, my Indian family. And look, the, the, the challenge for us uh, was, was a clear one. Uh, and yeah, this, is, these, this, was a tough, these, this was a tough decision. It's not a position I, I want to have sustained for- Ad infinitum. Ad infinitum, but it is important. I think it's important for our sport that we took a stand. And that's, that's the judgment that we made. And they're never easy. And yes, there are precedents. And yes, you will always get confronted with the, the what ifs. Why did you take so long to deal with the transgender issue? We didn't, actually. Um, transgender is not a, you know, we, we, there are two very separate issues in our sport. And I don't want to get into the 
scientific weeds here. We have something called DSD, which is differences of sexual development. It's mm -hmm. when uh, it, it's when um, a female is born a biological male that we've been dealing with for a long time. That often gets conflated with the transgender issue. If you and I had been sitting here even two years ago, we would not have been having a discussion about transgender in sport. It's a relatively new issue. But it's loud, and and, you know, and and people have the lead hasn't been taken. I think who was it to, who took the lead first? Was it Fila took the lead first in the swimming association? No, no, in America? we we actually did the we we took the lead in that space by introducing our DSD regulations. We then realised that we needed to look at the uh, the transgender issue. Um, we set up a, a a working group looking at it, and you have to be led by the science here, and the concluding issue for the council and yeah we we didn't but it's a clear issue seb isn't it transgender i mean ultimately for me um and i know this is you have to walk this tightrope with the viewpoint that sometimes you can fall off it and strangle yourself with the tightrope but but biological males and biological females yeah, but simon i wasn't going to chase weeks over this by making a decision or a judgment that wasn't absolutely supportable by the science i had to follow the science and Biology science, though, isn't it? It's a fact, isn't it? Well, yeah, of, of course it is. But but the the other the other potential was: is there something? Are there hormone suppressants that you could introduce into the medical protocol? And nobody could tell me that by having a suppressant in transgender that you could close that gap in one year, two years, five years, that the residual impact, and that's when I went, right, this is when well, we make the Well, there's margins of elite, elite sport at the margin. Any material advantage in elite sport is a margin. Yeah, but the, the, the issue in, in trans was, was, for me, very clear-cut. The judgment we took was that if an athlete has been, if a male athlete has been through puberty, mm -hmm. then that delta is, is there. Look. I've got daughters. Mm -hmm. I can remember them kicking the butts of their brothers and when they were running in school sports, 10, 12, they were, you know, they were winning. The second puberty kicks in, that delta opens. Of course. So for me, this, the, the decision ultimately was based on one very simple proposition. I am elected to protect the female category. Mm -hmm. And if I don't do that, no woman will ever win another sporting Absolutely event. Right. What we haven't, so, but the transgender issue is only, it's at elite level. I, I'm not saying that transgender athletes shouldn't be able to compete at a local level. They should be, you know, we, we don't want them to be denied the mental Can and you see physical. a transgender games? No, not, look, no. I, I'm not saying no. But what I am saying is, at this moment, we, we've we got the position we've got. I'm not going to bind the hands of my successors. I'm only there for four more years. It may be that we have second, third categories. I mean, if you're being realistic about it, the third Level category is still a male category, really. Yeah. Um, and there may be, you know, external events that get organized. But at the moment, the position for us is is very clear cut. Last question. You have tweeted your disappointment about Josh. <laughs> I Kerr thought I'd got and, away with this. <laughs> I mean, I don't particularly like that award ceremony anyway. Um, but what's your what's your issue there? Look, it's 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 personal, and it's also collective. I I was I was nonplussed by a guy that can win a fifteen hundred meter world record in a truly global sport, in a world championships, which was the biggest single global event last year. He beats one of the all-time best athletes at 1,500 meters, and he can't make a short list in his own country. And Why do you think that is? I have no idea, but I just felt, I got, I got irritable, mm. and I rang my you know, I rang my communications teams and they went, oh, well, and I went, I'm saying it. Good for you. And I just thought somebody, you know. Say I'm, what you mean and mean what you're saying. I'm president of the sport and I just, you know, my, and actually my first instinct when I heard that was I thought, are you having a laugh? <laughs> <laughs>
Mm. And that's exactly what I put in the tweet. Sebastian Co, thank you for being so upfront with me. I've really enjoyed it. So have I. Thank well you. Done. Well done, mate. Thank you. Upfront with me, Simon Jordan, is brought to you by William Hill. Future episodes can be found on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. 18 plus, please gamble responsibly. <laughs>